Well, Shana Tova, everybody, welcome again to the ZOA Book Club. I think this is what our about our 22nd meeting. Um, and I uh, hope everybody had a wonderful holiday and a meaningful fast and an easy fast. Um, today, we're very honored to have Joel Pollock with us, uh, who is the author of this book, which I'm trying to hold up, See No Evil, um, 19 Hard Truths the Left Can't Handle is the subtitle. And I, Joel is a very esteemed uh, a senior editor or editor-in-chief over at Breitbart. Uh, just today, uh, he actually uh, quote, quoted a uh, ZOA uh, press release, uh, which maybe he can, met, he can speak about. Uh, and uh, that ZOA press release actually and had quoted uh, something that Joel had written you know, all about the uh, the hoax of the uh, the Charlottesville hoax. Um, anyway, I will now turn this over to Joel. Uh, also, please, if you have questions for Joel, remember to either put them in the chat or raise your hand. The hand raising symbol is at the bottom of your, it should be either at the bottom of, of your screen or in the participants box. Um, Joel, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, and I appreciate your patience as I field messages and things like that. Um, obviously, very, very busy morning after the debate and lots of things happening uh, in a very, very fast-paced campaign where there are fights on every single front. So I appreciate your time and, and patience as I try to balance a bunch of different things this morning. Um, first thing I just want to say is um, See No Evil was my book in 2016. Um, my, I have a couple of books out now, and I'll hold one of them up for you. Hang on one second. Um, one of them is physical, the other one's an ebook. But my latest physical book is this one. It's Red November. And the subtitle is Will the Country Vote Red for Trump or Red for Socialism? Red November. So uh, that's really got a great reception. Uh, it's got five stars on Amazon, and it was a lot of fun to write. It's about the Democratic Party primary, and it's a madcap look at the process through which the Democrats eventually ended up selecting Joe Biden, cycling through a variety of candidates, many of whom were extreme left-wing politicians or activists. And I think it's really interesting how far to the left Joe Biden has moved. You saw Donald Trump bring that out a little bit in the debate last night. We'll talk about that. I know everyone wants to talk about the debate. Uh, the other book I have is called The Trumpian Virtues, The Lessons and Legacy of Donald Trump's presidency. That's an ebook, and it's out right now. In fact, it was released yesterday on Amazon, and it's the number one bestseller in the new releases category in leadership. So that's um, something I really uh, urge you to check out. And uh, yeah, so uh, you know, I I'll be brief, and I'd love to take your questions. The uh, first thing I think we need to think about in terms of the issue that ZOA is interested in in Israel is th this is an election unlike any we, we've had ever. Uh, we've never had a president who is as pro-Israel as Donald Trump, period. There's just, there's, no, there's just no question about it. We've also never had a president who's been as maligned as Donald Trump on the issue of, of anti-Semitism specifically. And there's no real basis for this, but it's essentially a fantasy the media have created and have invested in, it is very difficult to dissuade people of the idea that Donald Trump is, if not an anti-Semite himself, then at least too tolerant toward anti-Semites. And much of this comes from the rhetoric of the 2016 Republican primary, actually. So if you want to look at where this originated, it, it originated much like the uh, Russia collusion theory uh, with Republican attacks on Trump. And Democrats took them and, and weaponized them. But this really began in March 2016. And I can get into some of the details if you want. But essentially, because there were some right-wingers online who were vociferous and demonstrative in their support for Trump, largely because he was opposing the media, who they also hate, uh, they attracted the attention of people who deliberately hyped their profile and made them out to be a much greater influence than, than they are. They, they account for very few people in the United States today. If you put them all in one room, uh, you know, you, you'd still have room for, there'd be a lot of seats empty, let's put it that way, uh, and not for social distancing reasons. <laughs> there, there aren't that many actual white supremacists in America. And 
Trump has been maligned. He's been maligned not just by the media or the Democrats. He's also been maligned by mainstream Jewish organizations. I know that's something ZOA has brought attention to. So this is a really interesting election because it's unclear what the consequences would be for Middle East policy if Trump loses. If Trump wins, then I think you'll see the alliances in the Middle East solidify around Trump and around the American policy of support for Israel and opposition to Iran. If Trump loses, I think some of what he's achieved will remain. I think the Jerusalem embassy will likely remain. I think that some of the peace deals that Trump has managed to negotiate will remain. But I think that you'll see a retreat to the Obama-Biden era policy of appeasing Iran and isolating Israel for criticism. And it would be a strategic catastrophe. Uh, it's not one, obviously, that would be impossible to come back from. I think that certainly the Jewish people and the state of Israel have faced bigger challenges. But it would be a strategic catastrophe, just like Obama's precipitous withdrawal from Iraq was a strategic catastrophe. Uh, the, the Iraq war turns out to have benefited Iran most of all, even though we can argue whether it was justified or not based on what they knew at the time. It was clear that knocking out Saddam Hussein boosted Iran's hegemony in the region unintentionally, but that's what happened. Obama then made it even worse with his rapid withdrawal, which gave Iran a foothold in Iraq and, of course, led to the rise of ISIS in Iraq. Uh, allowing Biden to win and having a reversal of foreign policy in the Middle East would take Israel from a strategically strong point in its history and instantly reduce it once again to a weak point. It would disrupt the movement of Arab alliances toward Israel, and it would allow the Iranian regime, which is on the brink of self-destruction, actually, to revive its fortunes and become strong once again. The Biden foreign policy team has learned nothing. They don't really want to give Trump any credit for what he's done, and they don't seem to have absorbed the lessons of their own failures. People talk about the Iraq war, but the Libya war was a complete disaster. Turkey is now essentially controlling Libya with Islamist fighters that were uh, fighting other Islamist groups in the area and overwhelming the legitimate government of Libya. And that's all Obama's foreign policy. That's the result of a war very much like the Iraq war where the United States invaded or backed an invasion and then had no plan for the aftermath. So Obama, though he came to power largely on the back of his opposition to the Iraq war, then repeated exactly the same mistakes that the Bush administration made in going into Iraq. And it shows you the tenacity of the quote unquote deep state, the people in the Pentagon, the foreign policy establishment who seem to have the same responses to every problem. And they overwhelmed the Obama administration because Obama simply did not have the will or the insight to overcome those forces. Obama was interested in demonstrative displays of left-wing solidarity. He is very much a leftist, but he also is in a sense congenitally lazy. He just doesn't seem to be terribly interested in actually doing anything. If you ask yourself, where's Obama been for the last four years? He's been quietly maneuvering and manipulating a lot of these left-wing groups, but he's really done nothing. And he did very little in office either. He was held accountable for very little and he did very little. He golfed a lot. Trump golfs a lot, but Trump is also working a lot. Obama did not. And when things went wrong in the Obama administration, he was always shocked to find out about them. I do think that the United States is at a historic crossroads. And I think that the choice facing voters is a really stark one. And as I put it, it's between the red of red conservatism and the red of, of socialism. My concern is, I'm sure many, uh, it's one many of you share, which is that the United States doesn't really know what socialism means because the media are myopically focused on Trump and every perceived error and flaw and they have not really interrogated the meaning and consequence of Biden and the Democrats, what they're trying to do to the country. And Biden's largely become a figurehead at the head of a left-wing movement comprised of Bernie Sanders ideologues and apparatchiks from the Clinton and Obama era who will be responsible for carrying out Bernie Sanders' policies, which are their true beliefs anyway. I mean, the, the smart move until now in the Dem Democratic Party has been to fake moderate mainstream credentials, but to privately harbor left-wing utopian ambitions. And now those ambitions are going to be given full play if Biden wins. Um, I wanna talk about the debate a little bit. I wanna answer your questions. Let me just say this about the debate. I think Trump can win the election. And I think he has a very strong case for winning. I do think that 
he lost the debate last night. And I, I think Biden lost as well. So they both lost. And I think that Biden lost because he was dominated in every way. If the simple question before voters is who should lead the most powerful country on earth, the answer can't be Joe Biden after last night. He just simply looked weak. He, I'm not even talking about the substance of his answers, really. He just, he just looked beaten. He was not forceful. I don't think he scored any points. He had a couple of good one-liners, mostly rehearsed, but I don't think Biden looked strong at all. So I think that's one of the reasons you see an uh, instant poll of Hispanic voters by Telemundo showing Trump two to one winning in that demographic over Biden in terms of who won the debate. And I think that's because for Spanish speaking voters, the character of the leaders is more salient than the precise uh, answers given to policy questions. There were no questions on immigration. There was nothing about foreign policy. There was nothing about education. So the, the big issues for Hispanic voters, there was a little bit on the economy, but the big issues for Hispanic voters weren't addressed. Given that the issues where the details matter most to that demographic didn't come up, people are judging based on character. And, and I think you saw that. So Trump dominated the debate in that sense, or rather Biden failed to dominate. Uh, Trump lost because he did not forcefully condemn white supremacy in a way that he that would have stuck with people. Um, it's obviously false to say that he didn't condemn white supremacy. He did several times. And the reason people are saying he didn't is that Chris Wallace was talking over him, as was Joe Biden at the time. And Biden, in a rare moment, said, uh, kind of challenged Trump to do it, do it, say it. That's the old Joe Biden. That was the one time when Joe Biden was able to do to Trump what Trump had been doing to Biden all evening, which is, which is jabbing him and what Biden had done to Paul Ryan. If you remember the 2012 debate, Biden dominated that debate by constantly jabbing at Paul Ryan, constantly catching him off guard. Nothing Biden said passed the fact checking test, but he was pulling a lot of antics, talking out of turn. He did that to Ryan. Trump did it to Biden last night. The one time that was different was when Biden challenged Trump on the white supremacy issue. And Trump didn't Charlottesville hoax. And in my mind, it was inexcusable, actually. And I, I really hope that he shapes up for the next debate because all of the information Trump and the Trump team have needed to push back on that hoax and a lot of other hoaxes that Biden has used, all of that has been out there for months. And it's not Trump's style to revisit criticisms people make of him. He likes to be on offense rather, de rather than defense. But the country needed to hear him tell Chris Wallace directly that the quote, very fine people, was a misquote and that he had condemned the neo-Nazis totally and that Biden has been lying about it for two years. I think it's very, very important to say that. I hope he gets another chance to do it. I hope he does it even before the next debate because I think it's that important. The issue isn't whether it's going to change minds. I think the issue is that believing that Trump is weak on that issue is dispiriting to Trump supporters. And Trump supporters will still vote for him. They're not gonna change their votes. They know that this fine people thing is nonsense. But what the media have presented to the American people in a, in a large way is a choice between socialism and disorder on the one hand and white supremacy on the other. The white supremacy part is a caricature. It's, it's a lie, but that's the choice that has been framed. And I can say this in part because of my background in South Africa. I was born in South Africa during apartheid. I went back there after college, worked there for seven years after apartheid. And I can tell you that my experience of both systems, uh, and again, my experience under apartheid was, was different, but my wife grew up under apartheid. She was born in a segregated hospital and so forth. Um, my experience is that white supremacy is easier to get rid of. Let me say that again. I, White supremacy is terrible, but it is easier to get rid of than socialism. Socialism is almost impossible to get rid of. And the only reason that Eastern Europe got rid of it was because the United States effectively defeated the Soviet Union in the Cold War. But unless you have some external force that is challenging your socialist system, it will decay. It, it's, like a, it's like a cancer that, that kills the host. Uh, viruses, cancers, you know, there's no evolutionary reason for them to kill the host on which they depend for their survival, uh, but they do, they do so. And they exist to spread to other hosts and that's what socialism is. Socialism destroys the host and there's no recovery from it.
Uh, you can fight, you know, and I, I suspect that if Biden wins, we have the toughest fight of our lives ahead of us. Um, but I don't think it's easy to beat once it once it is in the system, once it's once it is part of what we do. And certainly look at the education system in this country. Look at states like California. California um, is, is almost completely lost to the far left. There's almost no way of recovering it. And, and there's no way back. It's not as if, you know, you can say, well, if Republicans said this or did this or nominated the right person, there simply is no path back from socialism because socialism rules out alternatives to itself in a way that other bad forms of government do not do quite as successfully. Um, South Africa was a white supremacist system that was resolvable ultimately because that system was still based in at least a facade of democracy and Christianity. And within democracy and Christianity, there were ways of resolving and removing white supremacy. Within socialism, there is no solution for socialism. It is impossible. It is a dead end. It is a maze with no exit. So that's, that's the danger of socialism. Anyway, let me open it up to, to questions from you and, and challenges and so forth. Liz, you have to unmute. Liz, you're muted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, everybody, please remember to uh, raise your hand or, or, or put your uh, question into the chat. And I see we have a hand raised. Uh, Daphna Yi. Daphna, please un unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes. Um, Trump did say uh, that the not neo Nazis were fine people. I heard him say it. And uh, he did not uh, refute uh, the white supremacists. He called the, uh, he said that the, they were prou proud people. And uh, he refused to say that the white supremacists, he refused to uh, deny the white supremacists. Okay, Daphna, did you watch the entire press conference where Trump was asked about that? And did you read the transcript? No, I did not read the transcripts. I heard him refuse to. Okay, so I, 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 Daphna, I, I think I, I think it would, it would behoove you. On hold sides. on, hold on. It I would heard behoove him you. say you there were fine people on both sides. Yes, and he was referring, if you look at the transcript, he was referring to people on both sides of the issue of the statue. And if you'd like, I can actually read to you what he said. I think it would actually be helpful. So let me, let me read this to you. Give me a moment to pull it up here. Um, I've, had, I've had to debunk this many times, so don't feel bad because the media have only shown you part of what Trump said. Um, but this is, this is uh, very common. And um, in fact, CNN reported it uh, correctly at the time. Um, the BBC has fact-checked this and said that it's uh, not true that Trump called the white supremacists fine people. So, you know, if you don't believe me, you can, you can listen to the BBC or you can look at what CNN said at the time. But let me actually just read you what Trump said. So Trump was asked um, about the, uh, the white supremacists and neo-Nazis, and this is what he said. Trump says, excuse me, they didn't put themselves down as neo-Nazis, and you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. He's talking, to, and let me continue. He, you had people in that group, excuse me, excuse me. I saw the same pictures as you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. A reporter answers, George Washington and Robert E. Lee are not the same. Trump answers, oh no, George Washington was a slave owner. Was George Washington a slave owner? So will George Washington now lose his status? Are we going to take down, excuse me, are we going to take down, are we going to take down statues to George Washington? How about Thomas Jefferson? What do you think of Thomas Jefferson? You like him? Okay, good. Are we going to take down his statue? He was a major slave owner. Are we going to take down his statue? You know what? It's fine. You're changing history. You're changing culture. And you had people, and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and white nationalists because they should be condemned totally. But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. So Daphne, that's what Trump said. And he clarified in his statement that he was not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists when he said very fine people. He was talking about the peaceful protesters on both sides. Um, and also the day before or two days before, he delivered a televised statement 
from the White House in which he specifically condemned, and I'm quoting here, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups. So I, I understand your confusion on this point because the media have driven home the idea that he called neo-Nazis fine people and said they were very fine people on both sides. I had an opportunity, in fact, to challenge Joe Biden directly at the Iowa State Fair as a member of the press. And I said to him, are you aware that you're misquoting the president? And Joe Biden denied that he was, but he is. And um, many people know this, many people don't know it. Um, I, hope, I hope I've helped you uh, at least question your initial assumption, but uh, Trump um, definitely condemned the neo-Nazis, not just in that press conference, but in a speech the day before. He's done so many times since. And uh, I, I think that Trump really uh, missed an opportunity at the debate to point that out. I hope you'll do it uh, either today or in the next debate. But um, again, it shows you how destructive this, this uh, lie is. You know, and I can tell you one other thing before I go back to questions. Um, those of us who are advocates for Israel understand exactly what this is. When the world media claimed that, for example, uh, 500 Palestinians were massacred in Janine in 2002, that was a lie. But it was on CNN, Saeb Erekat, the Palestinian quote unquote negotiator, made that claim on CNN. Now, all of us knew that was a lie. We knew it was a lie because, first of all, we knew in our bones that Israelis are not going to go and massacre civilians on purpose. We just knew that that's, that's, not, who, that's not who Israelis are. That's not who Jews are. But um, we had to deal with the fact that it was all over the news, repeated again and again. And I'll never forget that Benjamin Ben Eliezer, who was then the defense minister of Israel, told Wolf Blitzer on CNN, this didn't happen. And Wolf Blitzer didn't believe him. Wolf Blitzer said, are you telling me this is not true? And Ben Eliezer said, yes, this is not true. There were 54 casualties or whatever it was, 50 something casualties, 27 of them were combatants uh, or were, you know, whatever the numbers were. But and 21 Israelis were killed too in the pitch. Right. He, he pointed that out. And Wolf Blitzer could barely believe it because no one else was telling the truth. So I would caution you when the media and Joe Biden and so forth and, and Jewish organizations who should know better, frankly, um, when they tell you these things, you should question them because the same people, the same media outlets will also lie to you about Israel. And I have some relatives who are very anti-Trump, but who are in their hearts, at least very pro-Israel. And I say to them, if you don't believe the New York Times on Israel, why would you believe the New York Times on Trump? Yeah, um, by the way, if you want to see, if you want to see the, uh, the, ac the actual tape of this, go to the, the press release that, that, I, that ZOA put out yesterday, um, which has the, a copy of the tape and the transcript, uh, you know, the, the transcript lines uh, where, uh, by, uh, where um, Trump immediately after speaking about uh, fine people on both sides says, but I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not talking about white supremacists or neo-Nazis who absolutely have to be condemned. Um, and that, you know, and you, what happened is that, you know, as Joel said, uh, Biden took the first line at totally out of context and didn't, you know, didn't quote the second line. And this, this has really reached extremes. Uh, Biden uh, also yesterday uh, or, or Saturday accused, uh, likened, um, likened Trump to, go, to a go Goebbels um, and the uh, Democratic uh, uh, Jew, the Democratic Jewish uh, Council also put out a, uh, a, a horrific uh, video with Trump on one side and all this imagery of na Nazis and the Holocaust on the other side. Really, really just in inexcusable. Um, anyway, uh, l let me ask you a quick question from, from the book, the See No Evil book, which is um, you speak in the, when you discuss Israel, you speak about the truth that Israel's neighbors don't want peace and uh, singling Israel out for, uh, for criticism only encourages its enemies to keep trying to destroy it. And you, in the book, you talk about the different ways that people see um, Israel's achieve, miraculous achievements in medicine and science and so on, that, um, uh, you know, that some people, you know, pro-Israel people view that as something to tell the world about, but the anti-Israel people just see this as another excuse uh, for hating Israel and saying that Israel has too much power. And uh, Zeeway has been very cognizant of this. So we, we're sort of concerned when uh, other people, uh, other groups 
uh, tried to defend Israel by just pointing to scientific achievements, you know, because we feel that doesn't reach the root problem, and the root problem is the hatred on the other side and the desire to destroy Israel. Um, and so what, what's your view on this? And what's your view, could you speak a little bit about, you know, the efficacy of pointing to Israel's wonderful humane achievements? Well, let me take that a little further also. Um, I think it was common during the Obama era when there was a real crisis in U.S.-Israel relations for people to defend Israel by pointing to all the ways in which Israel is a liberal democracy where they have socialized medicine, isn't that wonderful? And they allow transgenders to serve in the military and so forth. All of that is appealing theoretically to a democratic audience. And there are two problems with that. First of all, it's not in its heart of hearts why people support Israel, okay? People don't support France for the same reasons and in the same way. I mean, the, people don't support Israel because it's the most liberal country. Jews don't have an affinity to Israel because of Israel's policies on the preservation of the environment or because Tel Aviv has a gay pride parade. I mean, that's a nice thing to tell people, but it's not why Jews support Israel. Jews support Israel because of the dream of 2000 years of returning home and because it is our spiritual homeland and it's because it's in every blessing after every meal. It's the direction we face in our prayers. It's essential to who we are, no matter where we are in the world, no matter what country we're citizens of and what flag we salute, our spiritual home is always Israel. And that's why we support Israel. And that's, that's a reason of love. And love is irrational. Love doesn't have to be justified. What's funny is that our critics give credence to arguments on the other side that have nothing to do with rationality or reason. It is accepted that the Muslim world views Israel or Palestine as its own because of faith. Because, well, anywhere that the armies of Muhammad conquered have to remain Islamic forever, have to remain in the Darul Islam. And that's just accepted. I mean, the, the other side's argument is essentially a theological and nationalistic argument. It's not a rational argument. No one is arguing that Palestinians should have the land that is Israel because Palestinians have achieved something scientific or because of the great achievements of Arabic language and mathematics in the Middle Ages. I mean, this is it's not, it's not actually the essence of the debate. The essence of the debate is Jews love Israel. That's it. It's not even enough to say that Israel uh, is, a, is a safe haven for Jews because that is something that plays into the myth at, at some level, can be used to play into the myth that Israel was only created because of the Holocaust. Certainly the Holocaust created political impetus for the UN vote and so forth. So, and, and Israel is a safe refuge and it's, it's one of the very good reasons to have an Israel. But... Israel has a positive reason for existing that has everything to do with love. And that's a more profound and honest answer. You're not really explaining why you're attached to Israel if you just tell them it's because of Israel's achievements. Now, again, it's a very good argument. I mean, and Hannah Arendt, who was not really a, uh, a Zionist in a political sense, argued that Israel's best case for itself was what it had managed to achieve in agriculture and settlement and so forth. She felt that it was a humanizing force. I think that's a very, very powerful argument. And I think it's also a powerful argument against what Palestinians do, because you never hear about Palestinians collecting money to plant trees in Ramallah or setting up universities to prepare Palestinian intellectuals, whether inside the Palestinian territories or outside or whatever. You never hear about any sort of positive developments taken towards statehood, toward building a society. Palestinian nationalism is simply anti-Israel. It's an, an anti-Semitic it, it, in some ways. It, it's not pro-Palestinian. Um, the other danger, I think, in just pointing to these achievements is that it misses the reason Democrats don't like Israel. Democrats don't like Israel um, because Democrats are taught to hate America. I won't say they hate America. I think many Democrats love America, even those who are saying anti-American things. But the essence of today's anti-Israel hatred in the Democratic Party is a hatred of America. It doesn't actually have to do fundamentally with Israel. And they hate America despite America's achievements. 
In fact, they hate America because of America's achievements. If you tell people about America's achievements, they will tell you that America achieved these things in some kind of unjust way. Or they'll tell you that celebrating these achievements upholds white supremacy. This is literally what the Smithsonian Institution was teaching people up until a short time ago. Maybe they still are, uh, but it was exposed online. That, that materials at the Smithsonian Institution at the Museum of African American History were telling people that things like scientific information, the scientific method, showing up on time, uh, these, these things which we consider central to Western civilization, these things were inherently white supremacist. And what university students in particular are told, and I can just say this from personal experience, is that whatever is achieved by private initiative is really done by the government. And anything done by private individuals has a cost, is a zero sum game, that if Bill Gates succeeds, it's because someone else fails. It, now, it doesn't help that some of the self-made billionaires of today's Silicon Valley do actually do a lot of harm. I mean, I think that Google has done tremendous harm to free speech in this country. I think that Facebook has become a censor and it's, it's actually a disgrace. Um, I don't think Zuckerberg is actually so bad. There are worse people out there, but I think that what some of these media giants have done with having too much power uh, is, is something akin to what the worst governments do when they have too much power. But in general, private success is one of the great achievements of our civilization, and we, and we are taught to hate it for that reason alone. And anti-Israel feeling grows out of that because anti-Americanism is also a hatred of success. And if you are taught to hate success, you eventually will hate Israel because you will not accept the idea that Jews built Israel's successes on their own. You will have to believe that everything Israel has achieved has come because someone else gave it to Israel or Israel stole it from someone. And in order to believe that, you have to subscribe to hidden hand theories of the world, that there's a secret cabal of people secretly arranging all these outcomes. And that leads inexorably to anti-Semitism. And it occurred to me only once I was in law school, I kind of went and sat in on some undergraduate lectures where I was told the professors were particularly bad. And I realized that the essence of anti-Israel activism, which is taking over in the Democratic Party, is really hatred of America. If you believe in systemic racism, then you can't interpret Israel's success as anything except racist. And unfortunately, a lot of Israelis who are attracted to ideas in America for the same reason that people everywhere are attracted to ideas in America. America is where things are at culturally. It's, where, uh, it's what sets the tone for the rest of the world. A lot of Israelis on the left have adopted fashionable attitudes toward these concepts that are completely inappropriate in the context of Israel. They're inappropriate in America, but they're especially inappropriate in a society that's facing existential challenge every day from within and without. Thank you for that beautiful answer. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, we have... Uh, Let's see who, who else. Uh, Paul Lipoff, please uh, unmute yourself and, and uh, ask your question. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. All right. I have four questions. You can answer all of them or one of them. Do they begin with Mainish Tana Halayla? Yeah, the four questions. And I'm the, uh, the wicked son. Good. Uh, the Dunham Report. What do you know about it? When is it going to come out? And if it doesn't come out soon, it's going to be useless. If, if Trump doesn't win. The visa to Saeed Arakat to teach at Harvard, uh, is it going to be issued? Do you know anything about that? Um, why are some people totally crazy, the Trump derangement syndrome? Why does he drive people crazy the way he does? And smart, capable, level-headed people have lost, lost their minds about this guy. And the final question is, your thoughts on um, a large portion of Jewish leadership of the main, mainstream Jewish organizations becoming uh, arms of the Democratic Party and not defending Jewish interests. Okay, let me see if I remember these in order. So the, the, the Durham report or the Durham prosecutions, I think they're not going to come out before the election. Unfortunately, Durham is in a position where anything he does between now and the election will be seen as politicizing justice, rightly or wrongly. 
Uh, that's the way it is. And I agree, he should actually not bring indictments before the election. He got one indictment and uh, that's, that's the best he can do, unfortunately. Um, I think if Biden wins, the Durham prosecutions are essentially over. You'll, you'll see some movement after the election before Biden takes office if Biden wins, the same way that you saw Pat Fitzgerald move on Rod Blagojevich after Obama won. I think Fitzgerald, the, the federal prosecutor in Chicago at the time, understood that Obama's allies in the Chicago Democratic Party wanted Fitzgerald out as soon as possible. And I think Fitzgerald bought himself some more time in the job and also preserved his ongoing investigations by going after Rod Blagojevich. So I think that Durham would accelerate everything if Trump lost, if there were only a few weeks left before a Biden administration took over. If he doesn't complete his prosecutions before Biden takes over, I think it's finished. I think the Democrats have created a situation where they believe a lot of the terrible things they've said about Trump and that in their own minds excuses any future abuse of power that they exert. So because they've told themselves that Trump politicized the Department of Justice, which is the opposite actually, Trump has depoliticized it. Um, but because they've told themselves that, they're going to excuse their own politicization or repoliticization of the department. Um, the next question you had was about the visa for Saeb Arakat. I don't know. I, I would assume he's, he'll be given a visa. He was recently given a visa for some medical treatment in the United States, and I don't think that they would deny him the visa at Harvard. I, I can tell you that Harvard has become something of a disgrace in terms of its coddling of left-wing ideologies. Uh, this is just one example, having him uh, sort of speak or teach. But to me, again, the roots of it all is anti-Americanism. Harvard's former president, the past president, is a Civil War historian named Drew Faust. And she spearheaded an effort at Harvard to identify all the historical sites at Harvard associated with slavery. Now, it's a very short list. I think Harvard had something like four slaves in the 18th century before slavery was abolished in Massachusetts. But the Harvard history with abolition is so much bigger and, and deeper. Harvard students died on the battlefields of Bull Run and Shenandoah by the score. The, the elite sons of Boston signed up to fight for abolition, to fight for freedom. There was a Harvard regiment, the Massachusetts 20th, and all of the other buildings and statues and so on at Harvard are named for abolitionists. And this Civil War historian didn't bring that up. She just decided not to talk about that. And I wrote, I wrote about it at the time. I, Harvard's really lost its way in, in much the same way that the elite institutions of our country in general have lost their way. Um, the other two questions you had, one was about Trump derangement syndrome and the other one, I can't remember. Jewish, um, leader, Jewish leadership. Uh, becoming, oh. uh, okay, so, so yeah. So Trump derangement syndrome is, is a function of, of cognitive dissonance of most people being unable to accept that they've been wrong when the evidence presents itself. What's interesting is there are a couple of people who seem to have un, you know, deculted themselves, who kind of fixed themselves. Um, one of them might be Brett Stevens of the New York Times. You know, he was a very, very anti-Trump pundit in 2016, conservative pundit who, who really opposed Trump being elected. He thought Trump's foreign policy would be a disaster. Nasty, nasty articles about Trump, nasty comments. In the last few months, he's become much more open to Trump. And I think it has to do with the peace deals in the Middle East, because Stevens, who used to be the editor in chief of the Jerusalem Post, by the way, I, sh I should correct my introduction. I'm, I'm not the editor in chief of Breitbart, by the way, I'm, I'm a senior editor. I'm uh, sort of one level down from that. I used to be the editor in chief, but uh, I traded that position for more editorial freedom. Anyway, um, it gives me time to write and to talk and do fun things like this. So, um, but I think that uh, Stevens is, is sort of um, deprogramming himself because he's looking at the evidence, but very few other people can do that. Um, the, the last question, which is about the Jewish community, the American Jewish community's leadership is essentially corrupted by the Democratic Party. And the early signs of this were in 2008 when Sarah Palin was disinvited from a Jewish community event that was a protest against Iran. Protest against a nuclear Iran in New York at the opening of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Hillary Clinton was invited and, and Sarah Palin was invited. They both accepted. The Obama administration, the Obama campaign did not want Hillary Clinton to appear. They didn't want voters to associate Palin with a, a strong female figure like Clinton. They were afraid that former Clinton voters would switch to Palin. 
So they backed out of it. They forced Clinton to back out. And then Jewish members of the Democratic National Committee told the Jewish organizations involved in organizing the rally that if they went ahead with just one party represented on the platform, on the dais, they would be at risk of losing their tax exemption after the election. And this happened throughout the next few years. Lawyers like Mark Elias and others, Democratic lawyers who got involved in the uh, Russia collusion and who are now involved in all these lawsuits in the states about expanding the voting times and all that, um, they basically threatened the Jewish organizations. And then throughout the Obama administration, they used the IRS in this way. Um, that's where the rot really showed itself for the first time. And you have to look no further than the ADL and, and other organizations. I mean, the ADL finally, after ZOA put out a statement yesterday, the ADL finally condemned that Jewish Democratic group for using Nazi imagery in association with Trump. But they didn't criticize Biden by name. And Joe Biden has been going around comparing Trump to uh, Joseph Goebbels, who is the propaganda man. I don't have to tell you who he was. You know who he was. Um, you know, comparing Trump to Goebbels, who, who uh, he's done it before. He did it in October. Um, the ADL couldn't bring itself to single out Biden. They have no trouble singling out Trump if, if there's even any hint of that. And um, of course, Trump has never done anything that bad, actually. Um, the worst, ADL singled out Trump in January 2017 when Trump, uh, he complained about the Russia stories being leaked to the media and Trump asked on Twitter, what is this, Nazi Germany? Referring to the way he was spied on. Now it was a hyperbolic statement, but it's not even in close to the realm of comparing your opponent to one of Hitler's top lieutenants. In fact, the person that Hitler left in charge uh, when he committed suicide. So th this is really um, part of a, the story of the corruption and capture of Jewish organizations by the Democratic Party. And look, uh, you know, ZOA knows better than, than anyone else that at its core, in its history, Zionism, although the only successful solution to the challenges facing Jewish communities in the 20th century and, and today, uh, Zionism was a minority creed among American Jews, that the bulk of the reformed Jewish movement rejected it, the bulk of the Jewish establishment rejected it, and now we see a reversion to the norm. The Jewish establishment today, including APAC, including other mainstream organizations, are not willing to do what it takes to defend Israel or defend the Jewish community. They're just not. They're not willing to do it. They've never been willing to do it except for a brief interregnum where the interests of Israel and a strong U.S.-Israel relationship aligned with the interests of the Democratic Party. Aside from that, there's no stomach for this fight other than among the minority of Jews who are religiously committed or committed ideologically and politically to the Zionist cause and to politicians of whatever party, Republican or Democrat, who will support it. And, and it, this is a minority creed in, in the American Jewish community. There are, there are complicated reasons for that, but that's the history. And we're, we're seeing a reversion to that. You see it in the reform movement. You see it in J Street. You see it in the mainstream Jewish organizations. Well, a lot of, a lot of our fight is to try to uh expand the Zionist movement and, and the, the love for Israel. Um, and we keep, we keep at it. Um, let me see, I, uh, oh, Alan Jay, uh, who is one of my colleagues at ZOA, uh, has posted a few things in the chat. And one of them is that uh, we're going to have a discussion on this very same issue by Dr. Charles Jacobs, president, who's the president of Americans for Peace and Tolerance on the uh, failure of uh, Jewish leadership today. And that's going to be tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. And the link for signing up for that is uh, in the chat right now. Um, I also should mention that the ZOA Book Club is going to have uh, next week uh, on Wednesday, October 7th at 7.30 7 p.m., different timing. Uh, we'll have um, Fight House, Rivalries in the White House, From Truman to Trump, featuring uh, Tebby Troy, best-selling author. And that, uh, that meeting is going to be hosted by my, uh, another one of my colleagues who is also here online, Sharona Whistler. Uh, and you know, so please, and the link for that book club meeting and for all these meetings are uh, uh, on, uh, in your chat. Um, let me uh, now call on Alan Skorsky, uh, who, uh, you know, good friend. Uh, Alan? I'm here. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Terrific. Mr. Pollock, it is indeed an honor, young man. Um, so I have so many questions, but I'm just going to limit it to this. Um, when George H.W. Bush ran and he selected Dan Quayle as his running mate, the media hammered him because uh, if anything happened to him, because he's so old, we're going to get the young and inexperienced Dan Quayle. 
When John McCain look at Sarah Palin, same thing. You're old, something's gonna happen to you, we'll be left with her. Here we have Joe Biden, who everyone can see is really on his last leg. And his running mate is someone who has no experience, who didn't even make it to the first round of the primaries, who has said that she supports BLM, who has said that she wants to uh, revisit our eating habits, who said that she wants to pay for health insurance for illegals. Her resume is replete with horror stories, and she is very, very viable to, to, fin to, to step in even before the first term is over. And there has been almost no discussion about that. Or who would she select as her running mate? <laughs> well, I mean, what, what exactly, where are you going with the question exactly? I mean, everything you say is correct. And she, she could definitely step in. I think in some ways they're expecting her to step in. I so don't I think, think but there's zero media coverage or even, even a single question about who are we really electing? Are we really voting for Joe Biden? Or, are we, or should we be asking more questions just about a second, Harrison? I, just a second. I, I, I got briefly interrupted, so I might as well introduce you to the interruption. This is my son, Alexander. Say hello to everybody. Hi. You can see he's- Hey, uh, big boy. He's very Hi. excited. Okay, go for Hi, it. Hi, Alexander. <laughs> um, he's adorable. <laughs> sorry, just, just wrap up your, uh, uh, your question, if you could, one more time. Just summarize it for me. Uh, basically, there has been no question put to Joe Biden about this. Um, and there's almost no focus on really who are we voting for? Are we really voting for Joe Biden, or are we going to be? Are we really going to be dealing with a Harris administration, whether it's next month, next year, or the oh, year okay. after? Um, I can answer that question for you. Uh, the answer is neither. You're not going to be dealing with a Harris administration or a Biden administration. You're going to be dealing with a Clinton Obama administration. You're going to be dealing with the Democratic Party apparatus. One of the reasons Kamala Harris is not being presented more forcefully by the Democrats is that they don't want her to get too big for her britches. She is the dominant player on the ticket. When she talks about the Harris administration, she's obviously letting that slip, but she's not the dominant player here. The Democrats do not want her to get the idea that if they win, that she's somehow in charge. Keep in mind also that she has no constituency within the party. I said that she was likely to win the primary, obviously Biden won the primary, but I, I said after that she was likely to be the vice president because she doesn't offend anyone in the party. There are, there are no groups that really dislike her within the Democratic Party. She can check all the boxes, she can get a nod from all the different factions, but she has no natural constituency in the party. She is not even very close to the African American community. And in this regard, it matters that she grew up in Canada. Um, I, I don't care what her parentage is. I mean, that, that's not the issue. Uh, she went to Howard University, you know, very well steeped in a sense in the, in the African-American heritage of that institution. But she doesn't really have an organic relationship with the black community in this country. Uh, there are very few places she can point to and say she's from. And as attorney general in San Francisco and California and as senator, she has always relied on the liberal gentry, largely white liberal gentry, to endorse her and to raise money for her. When Hillary Clinton lost, Kamala Harris went to Hillary Clinton's donors for support. She got her first job in San Francisco uh, through Willie Brown, who was the first black speaker of the assembly and first black mayor of San Francisco. Uh, but when she ran for Senate, it was Obama and Gavin Newsom and Jerry Brown and all of the San Francisco elite who stepped in behind her against Loretta Sanchez, who had initially the support of the Latino community, um, Kamala Harris has a lot of elite support, very little grassroots support, and the elites are going to control her. They're not going to allow her to run her own party. I don't think she has any idea what she would want to do if she did have power, other than just fulfill whatever ambition uh, feels like to her. But Kamala Harris will not be running a Harris-Biden administration. The Democrats are voting themselves collectively back into power. It will be run like a sort of hidden Politburo. And you can see it in the way that the Biden campaign is being run. They're keeping him in the basement, not only because he can't com campaign very well, but because he's not the candidate. Anti-Trump is the candidate. Anti-Trump is a blank check for the Democrats to do whatever they want to do. And right now, again, the left is in an ascendant position. There's a bargain that's taken place between in a sense, the money people in the Democratic Party and the grassroots people that 
they're going to fight within certain boundaries. They're going to have an argument within uh, certain constraints. You're not going to you're not going to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. You're not going to take away Wall Street's privileges entirely, uh, but they're going to have to empower the left in other ways, and it's going to be more explicit and more intense than it was under Obama. Obama shoveled a lot of cash to Wall Street, while also uh, doing things that theoretically, at least, Wall Street wasn't supposed to like. You're going to see that again in a Biden administration if he wins. Again, let me just reiterate, I think Trump can win. And I think Trump will be in a position to win going forward. There are things he has to do. He has to more forcefully condemn white supremacy. It's unfair that he has to do so. It's ridiculous to claim he never has done so, but he's got to do a better job of doing it. And I think that's part of it. He's also just got to keep pounding away at the differences between him and Biden. The fact that Biden is just not capable of governing the country um, you know, you can't campaign if you're not going to do more than one thing a day, and you certainly can't run the country if you're going to do that. Um, so I, I think Trump has a path to victory here. But I think, you know, af after last night's debate, it's, it's, it's going to have to take a lot of extra effort from Trump. This is going to be a fight to the finish and beyond. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me see. Da David Koppelman, I don't think you've asked a question on our book clubs in the past. David, and I think we're running out of time, so maybe David, you can ask your question, and Ken Greenberg, um, you know, so that we can maybe combine them, and if, if you could ask it, these questions as quickly as possible, because I know that uh, Joel has to leave pretty soon. David, are, are you there? David Koppelman? Can you unmute yourself? Are you there? Okay, uh, Ken Greenberg? Oh, he unmuted himself. Oh, okay, Dave. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank the speaker for a wonderful presentation. The question I, my major concern about a uh, Biden victory would be a return to the really anti-Israel uh, policies uh, of Obama, particularly his failure to veto the infamous UN Security Council 2334 resolution, which demands that Israel abandon any territory acquired after uh, uh, 67, uh, which would mean surrendering the Golan Heights and even the Western Wall. Uh, and uh, that's a real concern that Biden will go back to the cadre of Obama with Brennan, Kerry, Samantha Power, and, and the other group uh, that have a real, in my view, anti-Israel agenda. They view Israel as a neo-colonial power that stole land from the Palestinians. And uh, it's just outrageous that Jewish organizations don't address that. Yeah, I think Jewish organizations in general have done a very poor job of celebrating the Trump administration's achievements on Israel. You'll remember the Union of Reform Judaism had to retract its initial statement on Jerusalem. They criticized the move of the embassy to Jerusalem because the Palestinians wouldn't like it. Um, look, ZOA is, is, is doing um, a very, very important job. I think one thing you have to realize is as much influence as you try to gain, um, much of your work is going to be that of a minority within the community. And, and that's okay, actually. It's okay. You can achieve a lot as a minority. Zionism achieved its goal despite being the minority view among many Jews. Um, I do think that what you talk about uh, in terms of the Obama administration policies uh, in, repeating themselves in a Biden administration is absolutely 100% true. And I think that if Biden returns to office, the advisors he's bringing with him, the uh, Ben Rhodeses of the world, Samantha Powers and all those people, Susan Rice, I think they will have a new vindictive edge toward Israel that they didn't have even under Obama. They will punish Israel for Trump's success. I have to tell you on a personal level, I feel um, that, you know, taking off my analytical hat here for a moment, and this is a good note to end on, but um, I feel that the fate of, of the Jewish people actually hangs in the balance in this election. I feel that the fate of Israel hangs in the balance. I feel like the fate of the Jewish people hangs in the balance. Again, we've survived worse and we will fight like hell if things don't go the way they should. But um, when, I, when I prayed on Yom Kippur, you know, there, there are sections of the Machsor where you basically say to God, um, how can it be that a merciful God 
would allow his creatures to suffer. You know, be, be that God, be that king, be who you are, and, and give us mercy for our sins and so forth. That's the text of the prayer. Um, the, the prayer I prayed was, how can it be that a leader will come along and protect Israel and defend Israel and restore Jerusalem as Israel's capital and create peace between Israel and its neighbors and stand up to Israel's enemies and you would not reward that. That's my challenge to God on Yom Kippur, frankly. That's what I, that, that, was, that was the content of my prayer. It cannot be that, 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 that you will do that. That, that um, you know, our mission as, as human beings is to be better, to improve ourselves, and you know, we all work on those things. Um, I feel the uh, Jewish people have a demand to make of God, essentially. Do not let this champion of Israel suffer for having defended Israel. You cannot allow that to happen. And even if Trump were as bad as his detractors say he is, I would fight for him with everything I have simply because of what he's done for Israel. There are other Jews who won't. I'm sorry they feel that way. Many of them have an interest in the Democrats winning in various ways. But, you know, my, my challenge to God, really, is you actually owe Trump this victory. Um, now, God helps those who help themselves. So it's, it's from my perspective as, as a conservative writer, it's my job to push as hard as I can within the boundaries of my profession. I have to be accurate. I can't be ideological. I have to criticize. I've got a piece today out criticizing him for some of the things he missed in the debate last night. Uh, you know, I've got to be uh, sharp when I need to be, and I've got to be um, accurate, if, if not objective. But I feel like um, this is, uh, you know, what Trump has done is, is in a sense of historic proportions and um, even biblical proportions, if you want to put it in context, where, you know, the, the Persian emperor Cyrus the Great is praised in the Bible for allowing the Jewish people to return to Jerusalem and build the temple, rebuild the temple. Uh, Trump's, Trump's actions um, took that much courage and are of that much significance. So in my mind, it cannot be it cannot be. Obviously, you know, there are lots of things we can't explain in the world. We can't explain why bad things happen to good people, why people suffer in the world if, if God is good and just. So this could be another one of those. It could turn out that way. But my challenge to God, in a sense, on Yom Kippur is you cannot let this happen. Actually, you, you have a responsibility, Hashem, to make sure this doesn't happen. That's, that's, that's what I pray, to be quite honest. That's, that's very beautiful. Thank you so much. You know, and I, I do want to mention that ZOA um, has written several times about Biden's own statements about what his policies will be on Israel. Um, he made a number of statements at the Mis Million Muslim Vote Summit, where Biden appeared alongside um, the head of CARE, the head of MPAC, and which was Israel's destruction, um, Ellen Omer and Linda Sassour. Um, and he said that he's going to uh, re bring, uh, reinstate the uh, uh, our membership in, in the UNHRC, the Human Rights Council, which spends all its time bashing Israel. He's going to restore funding uh, to UNRWA, uh, which uh, hides, hides the weapons for Hamas. Uh, he's going to uh, restore funding, find a way to restore funding for the Palestinian Authority, which, as we all know, turns around and, and uses those funds to, uh, to make pay to slave payments to terrorists, to murder Jews and Americans, um, restore the uh, Consulate for the uh, separate consulate for the for the Palestinians in West Jerusalem. Uh, he, he's you know, going to restore the uh, the PLO uh, uh, consulate or P PLO mission in Washington D.C. In other words, reverse all the things that that Trump almost everything that Trump Trump put an end to. Trump put an end, yeah, end to you know well, the funding for the Palestinians, the PLO mission, and so on. So this is this is uh, you know this is a huge concern, and he also made these pledges in writing in the uh, statement of M Gage, yeah, that, which is the uh, Muslim Votes uh, organization behind the Million Muslim Votes Summit, and you know it's right there in writing what he plans to do, and it's, you know, we've written about it a couple of times. It's frightening, and you know I really appreciate uh, the question about this. Um, do you have time for any more questions, or I know you have a sure, I, can, I can take a couple more. Sure. Okay, um, Ken Greenberg. Ken, can you, can you hear me? there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. You can, okay. 
Uh, first, thank you so much, Joel. Uh, I love your writing. I share your articles on Twitter, Facebook, and Parler now. And uh, thanks to Liz and uh, Jay and Sharona for putting this together. It's fantastic. I have two questions. One's very quick. How do we get a signed copy of the book? And the <laughs> second one is, could you elaborate a little bit on, um, you know, the Obama gate, spy gate? I know, you, you know, we're not going to get a Durham thing till after the election for whatever reason. But you've got Chris Ray out there saying Russia is trying to denigrate Joe Biden. I mean, none of it makes any sense or that white supremacy is the number one threat we face in the country. It's not China. I mean, you got people in the deep state doing this nonsense and they're still there. I don't know why Chris Ray is still employed. He holds up everything we're trying to get uh, from uh, Judicial Watch and whomever is trying to do the right thing. So any elucidation you could give us on that and how we get the sign copy. <laughs> uh, the sign copy thing is very difficult. I don't know what to do exactly. Um, you know, if there are copies that you have uh, that you'd like me to sign, or if you, you can, you know, I don't know, perhaps we can talk to the organizers about, um, you know, sending me something or, or I, can, I can get your address and send you something. I'm, I'm happy to sign. Obviously, it's one of the difficulties of promoting a book in the coronavirus era. But, you know, if you hang on to the book, I will, <laughs> I will sign it eventually. Um, what was your other question again? The... Um, uh, why Chris state. Ray is still there, disinformation from him, where's, where it's going with Obamagate and Spygate, if you can. Yeah, look, I, I, I don't think that Chris Ray is deliberately trying to sabotage Trump. Um, I think there's an institutional culture in the FBI and other places that grows up around certain ideas. And the fact is that white supremacist groups have been a very important target of law enforcement for the last 30 years. And I, by the way, they're not new. I mean, they didn't, I didn't start with Trump. Um, when I was growing up in Skokie, Illinois, we had, there were the Nazis that tried to march through in the 70s. But in the 90s, there was a white supremacist kid who came through and shot six Jews in West Rogers Park, all of whom survived. And he shot one of my neighbors, the African-American basketball coach, Richie Bird, Ricky Birdsong, who died. And um, he went on to shoot two Koreans at a church and he was finally uh, killed in a confrontation with law enforcement. That was in 1999. Uh, he was just finishing college. And, you know, that, that's not new. I mean, that was in the Clinton administration. Um, the response to that was to, to build up an apparatus to monitor and control and stop these groups, especially after Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing. So, you know, there's an institutional culture. People protect their turf. And obviously, the departments or the, or the parts of the FBI that, that, have made a career out of finding white supremacy are going to say, we need more resources to find and fight white supremacy. Um, these groups are dangerous. They're very small, but they have access to weapons and they carry out attacks. Now, <clears throat> Black Lives Matter is a much bigger movement. They've been uh, very destructive, although thus far at least, uh, less so in terms of human life than, than white supremacists have been. Um, you know, depending on how you measure it, I guess. But um, I think Chris Ray is reflecting an institutional culture. He's an institutional guy. And, you know, I, I fault him for failing to rise to the occasion. I don't think he's deliberately trying to undermine Trump. But he, like James Comey, feels that his first duty is to the agency. And that seems to be part of the culture of the FBI, that your first duty is to protect the agency. And that's not what, what we really want them to do. Right? We want the FBI to protect the Constitution, and we want the FBI to protect law and order. And one of the difficulties of that kind of institution is by its nature, it's very clubby. Um, it's, it's almost like a fraternity uh, or sorority. It, it's got very, very close connections. That's why these stories of, of affairs between uh, Lisa Page and Peter Strzok are not terribly surprising. It's a very insular, small institution relying on very close bonds and I think that's one of the reasons that you see FBI director after FBI director unable really to reform the organization. I made the sort of radical suggestion, which was picked up at the time by Matt Drudge back, to, back in his conservative days, um, that the FBI be dismantled and rebuilt, that they, basically the organizational culture had become um, such a problem that it had to be uh, redone. Not like, not abolish the FBI, essentially, although that was, that was the headline. But um, what I meant was, you know, we, we want the FBI, but it can't, it, if the rot goes that deep, 
um, that they can't see the difference between their own political views and their job as law enforcement and investigators, um, then you have to basically break it up and start over. Um, you have to break it down. And it's always been a problem for the century it's been around. I mean, the FBI's had all kinds of problems like this from the days of J. Edgar Hoover until now. It, there's, there's something in the organizational culture that is um, unfortunately toxic. And that, you know, again, there are a lot of good agents and so forth, people who really care. But for some reason, this um, nefarious behavior keeps happening. Um, it happened to Martin Luther King. They spied on him. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's a problem that hasn't been dealt with. And now I think we're at the point where we need to take a hard look at it. Liz, you're muted. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Malka Lippman wrote in, uh, she had a question about the bias of the moderator last night and the role of the moderator, um, which I, I know a lot of people have raised issues about. And uh, maybe we'll combine that with uh, Charna uh, B. Uh, do you have a question? Can you unmute yourself, Charna? Thank you for the question. Charna? Yeah. Can, can you ask, please ask your question? No, I don't have a question. Oh, you had your hand raised. Oh, I don't see it. <laughs> okay, uh, Faggy Y has a hand raised. I would like to say thank you. This has been wonderful. It's really been interesting. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Faggy, Faggy Y? Faggy Y, do you have a question? Can you unmute yourself? All right, uh, Michael, Michael Goodman. Yeah, hello. Uh, I was going to ask you a question. Um, I saw on some posting from uh, one of the may, mainstream media sources uh, today online that there supposedly is a concern among some um, senior officials in the intelligence community that the latest uh, revelations about uh, Trump's uh, personal and business finances may actually make him a security risk. And the fact that somebody with uh, this type of a financial history would probably not be eligible for employment uh, within an intelligence agency. I was wondering if you could address that. Do you think that there is any uh, truth to this concern or do you think that that's just more hype? Thanks. Yeah, I think that's just more hype. I, I think that the tax return story was, as, as the British say, a damp squib. It basically failed to detonate. And there's nothing there. I mean, they went through these tax returns and found no Russia, no payments to Michael Cohen. They found that he was under audit, something that the media had treated with skepticism for a long time. And it's not even true that he only paid $750. I mean, Trump paid millions in taxes in years when his taxable income was only 750 or, or zero. He rolled over those taxes into future payments, but you know, you're allowed to offset business losses and depreciation. This is something that everybody who's run a business knows and, and has to deal with it, uh, has to deal with. Um, I don't think there's anything compromising in there at all. And again, Trump's not trying to get a position within an intelligence agency. Technically, the president isn't even a member of the intelligence community, although he sits at the top of the pyramid and he can declassify whatever he wants. Um, if we had to apply that standard to presidential candidates, Barack Obama would have been disqualified for drug use, admitted drug use. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. you know, right. if Obama wanted a job in the FBI, he would have been turned down. So I think, you know, this is just more media hype. And, uh, you know, people will say anything in the weeks before an election. So I think I've just put it down to that. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, Rachel Epstein uh, has a question. Hi, yes. Um, actually, I'm here with my boyfriend, Itai, and we're in Israel, so this is yeah. really exciting for us. So I'm going to let him go ahead and ask the question. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you for asking this, uh, this talk. I have a question. As Israeli, I've heard uh, your talk about Israel and uh, the relationship with the current president. My question is, uh, why do you think uh, or underestimate uh, Israel's ability uh, to succeed regardless of the whoever is going to be the president, uh, because I feel that's a lot of times uh, one of the biggest concerns of uh, American citizens choosing the right president for them. 
Well, I think it's because people recognize that Israel faces constant threats. Um, you know, I have a lot of Israeli family, um, predominantly in, in Haifa. Um, and the, the experience of the Second Lebanon War in particular um, was a tremendous shock to my family in the north. And, uh, you know, my cousin who was called up to reserve duty um, went to the front in Lebanon and, you know, came back uh, and, and, you know, told, told the family privately um, that things were very bad. Things were going very badly. And uh, meanwhile, his parents in their apartment in Kiryat Motzkin, or in their home in Kiryat Motzkin, were under rocket attack, uh, really for the first time, uh, not happening in Kiryat Shmona, not happening near the border, but happening in Haifa. I think that shatters um, confidence in a society. And again, that was 14 years ago. But I think it's very clear that Iran is planning for a second round of that. And that Iran is doing everything it can to arm Hezbollah and Hamas and these other groups, Islamic Jihad. And that the question of whether to stand up to Iran is one that American presidents will answer very differently. The Obama-Biden administration gave Iran free reign in the Middle East, even if one accepts the argument that they got this great deal with Iran on the nuclear question. The nuclear deal did nothing about Iran's support for terrorism. In fact, it probably encouraged terrorism. It funded terrorism, as the Obama administration admitted reluctantly. Uh, it, it encouraged Iran to continue developing nuclear capable ballistic missiles, funding all of its various proxies. The Syrian civil war went out of control. I mean, at the end of the Obama administration, ISIS was on the border of Israel, essentially. And on the one hand, it made it easier for Israel to make a case of keeping the Golan. You don't want to give the Golan back to Syria when Syria might be run by radical Islamic terrorists. Um, I think it shows you there really is a difference between which kind of administration controls the United States in respect to the larger geostrategic threats in the region. And once upon a time during the Cold War, when the Soviet Union was something that even Democrats recognized as a threat, it didn't really matter necessarily whether it was Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon who was there in a time of war. Because Lyndon Johnson during the 1967 war and Richard Nixon during the 1973 war were both very supportive of Israel. Um, Nixon, obviously, with the resupply during the Yom Kippur War, very, very important. But Lyndon Johnson was also very supportive. And in fact, um, you can mark the point where America became more involved in arming Israel uh, during the Johnson administration. So that was all in the context of Cold War politics. Both Republicans and Democrats recognized that the Soviet Union was an existential threat to the United States. The Soviet Union backed the Arab states, and therefore the Soviet Union had to be opposed. Now there's no agreement in the United States over what the regional threat is. Obama defined the regional threat as us. The United States is the problem in the Middle East. And instead, that's different than saying the United States is too involved in the Middle East. Obama identified the United States as a malevolent influence. And that colored his relationships. First, he tried to reach out to the Sunni world. He bowed to the Saudi king. That went nowhere because the Saudis weren't interested in a weak America. They wanted a strong America. They wanted America to do different things, maybe things that aren't good for America, but they didn't want America to be weak. The Iranians were Obama's next audience, and Obama saved Iran from the Green Revolution. It was a crucial moment. He came into office with America in a very strong position strategically, with 100,000 or so troops in Iraq and a similar number in Afghanistan. Iran was about to topple from within, and Obama saved the Iranian regime just so he could make this nuclear deal at some later date. That was an historic mistake. So it really matters, and I think it, it sets up the, the, the chessboard on which Israel has to play. Um, and I think that given the fact that Iranian-backed militias are sitting on Israel's borders, and I mean, obviously you know this, I'm not telling you something you don't know. Um, from an American perspective, and you know, with some empathy at least from an Israeli perspective, I think it matters a great deal. Now, I think your point is also a good one, which is that Israel has learned to be self-reliant to the point where it doesn't need to depend on the United States. Um, you can make this point on a variety of ways. My favorite way uh, to illustrate Israel's independence is to talk about water. Israel is the first country in the history of the world to be completely independent 
on the issue of water. Israel is completely independent on water. This is a very new development the last few years, but it wasn't obvious this would happen. I mean, Israel is a dry country. It only has the Kinneret. The Kinneret is highly contested and other water sources are very hard to find. But Israel has managed through desalination, through reservoirs, through reuse, recycling, high technology, waste water retreatment. I mean, all, all these amazing things. Israel has, has decided to become independent. And Israel basically takes the position that no matter who wins in the United States, we have to survive. That's true. And I think Israel will survive. I think Israel's survival becomes more of a challenge if right now the administration is a democratic one. The Democratic Party has to be rescued from itself. And it's my view that only defeat will rescue the Democratic Party. Only in defeat will Democrats start to ask themselves, do we really want to let the left run our party? Not the ordinary left, I mean the extreme left, which is currently on the rise inside the Democratic Party. Thank you so much. Uh, David Berg, if, if you have a chance, uh, time for one more question, I think we'll make that the last question. Uh, D David Berg, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much, Joel. Uh, I, I heard you speak a, a few weeks ago to the Jewish Republican Alliance here in LA, uh, and you've been brilliant on both occasions, and I deeply appreciate your insight. Uh, I, I agree that uh, Trump fumbled uh, last night the opportunity uh, to speak forcefully on the issue, to debunk the Charlottesville libel, and to speak forcefully against right-wing extremists. My question is, when you have a situation that even a Fox News moderator uh, spends a good chunk of the debate challenging Trump on how much income tax he paid and never challenged Biden on things like the January 5th, 2017 uh, meeting in the Oval Office, the uh, many reports about his family's corruption, his numerous uh, uh, it, it, arguably racist statements he's made uh, over the years, his numerous lies about his personal biography over the years. Given that obvious imbalance, even on Fox News, how does the Trump campaign now going forward in the next month uh, make this case to the American people? And uh, should they be running more national advertising or is there advertising going on in swing states that we don't see if we live in a place like California or maybe New York. Uh, but it's, yeah. it's so frustrating that the information is so biased and I'm trying to understand what Trump can do about it, what the Trump campaign can do about it going forward. Thanks again. I think this also echoes Marco Lippmann's question about the moderator. So. Okay, so look, I mean, the moderator was Chris Wallace. Chris Wallace hates Trump. And I wrote a piece in late, uh, late last week or early last week, actually, um, saying that Chris Wallace was going to do this. I mean, I, I predicted it, it was predictable. And I'm, I'm not, you know, particularly, you know, genius or whatever to figure this out. Chris Wallace was going to be Trump's toughest opponent. Um, the article, if you're interested, is something like, will Chris Wallace be the Megyn Kelly of the Republican debate? You know, in other words, Megyn Kelly saw her role in the first Republican primary debate in 2015 as taking out Trump. And Wallace, uh, I think, tried to do the same. It's very interesting to me that Wallace interviewed Trump uh, just a short time ago and didn't ask him about white supremacy at all. He saved that for the debate. So I, I think that Chris Wallace knew what he was doing. Now, having said that, Trump needed to overcome that. Um, I've been in many situations where I'm the only person arguing my point of view. On a panel discussion that's, you know, I get invited once in a while to speak at University of Southern California, and I'm the only person on the panel who has my view, and there are five other people who have the other view. Um, when I was on CNN shortly after Trump was elected, I was the only person on a three or four person panel supporting my point of view. The fact is that in this environment, you're always going to be um, facing impossible odds. And Trump is capable of winning. When I go into that situation, I actually like it. I actually feel that um, now is the chance where I can really prove myself in the same way that Trump really had a chance to smack down the Charlottesville thing because they served it to him on a platter. Um, so I, I share your dismay. I don't think anything can be done about the moderator. I do think Chris Wallace um, has hurt his career because even though he might have burnished his credentials with fellow journalists who, who will you know, let him into the cocktail parties and so forth, um, I think he's lost his Fox audience. 
there's no way the audience is coming back to Chris Wallace after that ever. And that was what happened to Megyn Kelly as well. Um, Fox News, people want to see a variety of views on Fox. And I think it's good that they have a variety of views. What people don't want Fox to do is take them for granted. And I think that people feel Chris Wallace takes them for granted. Um, I don't think Chris Wallace will stick around at that network very long because he's just destroyed his relationship with the audience. And I think the parting, if it happens, will be acrimonious and he'll talk about a fox has lost its way. It'll be sort of a more highbrow version of the Shepard Smith parting. But you cannot insult the audience. The audience on Fox is clued up about things like Charlottesville. Um, and to your point about what do we do, my, my point is things like this. this. You're doing something now today by having a forum like this where you're sharing information that's more effective than any kind of advertising. When you share a Breitbart article on Facebook or Twitter, you're doing more to reach people who might listen or pay attention than anything the Trump campaign can do. I happen to think that very few minds are going to change based on what happened last night. I think most people have decided who they're voting for already, and very few people are persuadable. But you never know. And what you're doing now, what you can do with the tools you have available to you, if you do it in a responsible way, and again, it's unfair. They censor us if we step a toe over the line. You know, yes, I know. People on Facebook get banned for innocuous, factual information. Be careful how you package things, but get the word out. Um, I want to just leave you with one thing. I don't mean to say that the entire debate was a failure. You ask, what can Trump do? Um, I, I tweeted this last night that I thought Trump did what he had to do. What he, Trump did what he came there to do. And that was the following. First of all, Trump dominated Biden physically. Again, if you watch what Biden does in debates and what he tried to do last night, Biden doesn't win on the facts. He's not a very good debater. Biden wins by being louder and more obnoxious and being a bully or a clown. That's how he defeated Paul Ryan. I was a big Paul Ryan fan back in the day. I was stunned at how Biden beat Ryan. It was very disappointing to me. But um, he did it by raising his hands and rolling his eyes and banging the table. Trump did that to Biden. And there's nobody who can look at the contest between those two men on stage and feel like Biden's a strong leader. Remember, the country is, is voting for someone to lead us against our enemies. And Trump dominated one of the guys who wants to be that guy. Trump basically said, I'm the one to fear. And Biden did not look fearful at all. That's a problem. Um, the other thing Trump did, and this is something Trump did very well, and perhaps he, he needs more credit for it, but Trump drew contrast between his approach and Biden's approach on every issue of importance. So when it came to the economy, Trump said, I want to open it up. Biden wants to shut it down. And Biden said, yeah, I want to shut it down. We should all wear masks and stay home. I want to open schools eventually, but we got to shut it down first. So Biden tried to argue that his side of that divide was better, but he didn't deny the contrast. At every stage, Trump found ways to divide the two in ways that turned out to be favorable to Trump. That was really important that he did that. If he had failed to do that, I would have thought Trump really lost the debate. As it was, I think you have to score the debate a draw. But it was one of those draws, you know, uh, Gary Kasparov, who hates Trump, by the way, but Gary Kasparov, the great Russian, or uh, I think he's Azerbaijani, uh, half Jewish chef, a chess champion, um, was once in a match with Nigel Short in the early 90s for the World Chess Championship. And he was a better player than Short, so he eventually won. But there was one match in the 20 match series when Nigel Short was beating, uh, actually, sorry, Nigel Short was losing to Kasparov. Kasparov was beating Short, but Kasparov didn't see it. And he offered Short a draw and Short immediately accepted. And a draw gets scored, you know, one half point to one half point and they walk away and they play the next match. But immediately after the draw was declared, Short went up to Kasparov and said, you were winning in this position. And Kasparov couldn't believe it until Short showed him that he had been winning. And Kasparov was devastated by the news. It's devastating to a chess player to find out that you could have won if you just saw the right move to make, but you had to accept a draw. That's what happened to Trump last night. After the debate, I looked at it and I thought, you know, Trump was so sharp on so many of these issues. He was so good. I liked the way he came out aggressively and so forth. He could have knocked Biden completely out of the race if he had just answered that Charlottesville charge if he had just answered the white supremacist question better because that allowed it to become a draw and it it's now feeding the news cycle and all the attack ads and all that sort of thing so he kind of allowed biden back in um i think now it's a tough race to november to be honest i think it didn't look like trump had the upper hand but looking back at it you know going in maybe it didn't look that way now looking back at it 
you know, you feel like Gary Kasparov looking at the chessboard and realizing, my God, I could have won this match, but I, I misplayed something. So that's where it is. I think Trump drew the contrast. That's the important thing. The most important thing you can do is buy my book because it's got a good, a lot of information in it. The, the ebook, The Trumpian Virtues, has a whole history of the Trump administration. Part one is a really nice summary of the Trump administration. And then part two, I'm talking about Trump's virtues as a president. Um, and then of course, Red November is a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, buy the books, obviously, um, but also spread the words, share the articles, get the word out, and keep doing events like this. This is very, very important. Um, Joel, I want to thank you again, you know, and I also want to encourage everybody to buy your books. Um, the only one I have so far is uh, See No Evil, but it's a great book, and I'm looking forward to buying your other books, and I hope everybody else here will. And uh, I hope everybody will join us at our upcoming events with Charles Jacobs tomorrow and Tevi Troy next week. Again, the, those... Uh, the information about that is in your uh, in the chat so that you can sign up right away. We'll also be sending out emails to everybody. And uh, you know, also, please, you know, we really appreciate it in these difficult times. If you can help out ZOA any, you know, with contributions, joining, uh, you know, we re it's, it's really helpful, to, especially helpful to us at this time. And so that we can continue these programs and writing and spreading the word and Thank you again, Joel. This has really been great. And thank you for giving us so much time and, and your wisdom. And uh, we really appreciate it. And hope maybe you'll come back and speak about one of your other books. Um, thank you again. Okay, thank you again.